Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm Andrew Hawkins. I'm uh, a specialist architect in mobile data solutions. Uh, I work for BA Systems Detica. Uh, and just want to talk about the sorts of choices you need to make when you're uh, implementing mobile data, and with particular reference to the uh, to police and law enforcement applications, which are my particular speciality. So in terms of contents for the presentation, um, I will do a very, very brief, and I promise it will be brief, introduction to my company, no more than a minute or two. Uh, I then want to look at um, how mobile data systems are being used uh, in police forces uh, and what the benefits are. So what are the real world measured benefits um, of these mobile data systems? Um, we'll take a look at bearers. I'm sure you've, you've already heard a lot of um, uh, discussion about different bearers uh, in the sessions already. Um, but just taking a practical look at the different bearers and the, uh, and the choices between them um, and how you can maximize uh, the benefits there. Um, next item to have a look at is the choice of devices. So obviously devices are absolutely critical to a, to a mobile data system and there's some key decisions to be made there. Uh, and the final point I want to touch on is the uh, security considerations, which particularly for a law enforcement system are absolutely paramount. Uh, and then finish with uh, conclusion and any questions. So very, very quickly, uh, BA Systems Detica. Well, BA Systems, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, uh, are a major UK uh, aerospace and defense company, uh, 22 billion turnover. Uh, Detica is part of BA Systems, and we're about 2,000 people, about 40 years experience. Uh, and our key markets are defense, uh, law enforcement and government uh, and within there we specialize in uh, secure data and information intelligence systems so it's really the combination of security and data uh, and that's why uh, it lends uh, our sort of expertise into into mobile data systems um, and why I'm qualified to speak to you today, uh, just in terms of mobile data, so we've been supplying mobile data solutions for uh, sort of over 15 years, uh, six years and probably more like eight years actually now in the police market particularly. Um, in the UK, we have two, two big customers to talk about in particular. Uh, one is the Metropolitan Police Service uh, based in London. Um, and for them, we've supplied a solution which consists of 4,000 handheld PDAs, handheld mobile devices, uh, about 1,500 uh, in-vehicle computers, uh, which are commonly known as MDTs, mobile data terminals. Uh, and those systems use a mix of both commercial uh, 3G GPRS and Tetra bearers. So I'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation, but the, the contrast between commercial networks and, uh, and the Tetra-based airwave network in the UK. Um, and we're also deploying uh, a solution up in Scotland in the UK for uh, Strathclyde Police, and that has 800 uh, handheld PDAs. Those are Motorola PDAs, uh, and if you would like to go to the Motorola stand at all, you'll actually be able to see those PDAs and the, the application in action if you want to see the thing in a little bit more detail. Okay, enough of the uh, information about me and the company. Let's move on to, um, uh, to the main content of the presentation. So the first thing I wanted to look at um, is what are these mobile data systems actually being used for practically on the ground? Uh, and there are four main areas that we find our, our customers um, are using these systems for. Um, <clears throat> the first is to securely search um, classified back-end databases. Um, so the key to these applications is providing access from inherently insecure devices. So these are mobile devices often working over public mobile phone networks um, or, uh, or Tetra-based networks uh, and coming into uh, back-end systems which are often highly secure and classified. And clearly there's a, there's a kind of mismatch there in terms of security. So um, what we do there is we allow them to securely search back-end databases. And typically what the policeman in the field will be looking for there is to search for people, uh, including photos, so that they know who's standing in front of them. They'll search for uh, vehicles, for license plates, uh, names and addresses, driving licenses, uh, warrants for people who have been arrested or who need to be arrested, uh, and things like stolen property. And the benefit here is it allows the police officer in the field to make uh, better decisions. So if they've got someone in front of them, 
or the person's got a phone that they think might be stolen, they can take the phone, they can put the serial number of the phone into their PDA, search a back-end database and see if that phone is stolen. Uh, for example, that's one application and they can make decisions based upon that information. The, the second main area is uh, instant management. So most police forces will operate a central command and control system which task is, tasks police officers to instance. Uh, in a mobile data concept, we can extend that instant management to the mobile devices. So the instant that an officer needs to attend is pushed out to their mobile device. Um, they can instantly see uh, what the incident involves, where it is on the map, where they need to go, um, and they can update their status automatically, update the incident, and send that information back to the control room. So the control room can see they've arrived at the incident, they're dealing with it, it's coming to a conclusion, and then eventually that, that police officer or that vehicle is now available to service another incident. Um, so it really allows much more timely tasking to incidents from that perspective. The third area is form submission, um, and this is where officers in the field, rather than filling in paper-based forms, um, they'll fill in forms uh, electronically on a PDA. Um, that will get sent automatically to a back-end system, and they can also have a paired Bluetooth printer with their PDA, so they can print out the form and hand it over. Rather than a paper-based version, they can hand a printed version uh, to whoever they're dealing with in the streets. And this, the, the major benefit of this is it, it improves data collection considerably and it um, uh, gets rid of a, a whole bunch of back-end bureaucracy. So whereas previously you had a paper-based form with some illegible handwriting on that had to be typed in by someone in a typing pool, that whole process is, is short-circuited. Uh, and then finally, uh, the other main area we find of use is intelligence briefings. So this is typically daily briefings that go out to police officers that tell them uh, what they should be looking for, the top 10 priorities of the day. Uh, you can see a little picture on the right-hand side there, you know, a mugshot with some information on what we're looking for. Um, and this is typically information that's given to police officers before they go out on a shift, but it's often forgotten. Uh, and so having it on the device means it can easily be accessed as they walk around. And so what about the benefits? Well, in terms of the real-world benefits, you see some examples here. These are, these are real-world examples taken from some of our customers. I won't go through them all, um, but you can see that typically um, police officers are saving 30 minutes per shift uh, where they would have been in a police station. And that, that is the absolutely bankable saving of these systems. So rather than sitting in a police station on an IT system, these guys are actually out in the field doing their, uh, doing their job. A few other stats here, you can see um, there's a threefold increase in the number of queries to back-end systems, whereas previously those queries have been done by voice, they can now be done by data, and a significant transfer of traffic from stretched Tetra-based voice channels to mobile data, freeing up the voice channels for the emergency communication rather than the humdrum communication of searching back-end systems. So let's move on to um, the first main factor then in, in selecting your mobile data system, and that is the choice of bearer. Um, so when we implement a mobile data system, typically, and this will come as no surprise, we'll be looking at a combination of uh, commercial public mobile phone networks, 3G or LTE, um, uh, Tetra-based networks, uh, or occasionally TEDS-based networks, and um, Wi-Fi, be it public Wi-Fi or some kind of um, uh, secure Wi-Fi. And the key decisions we're looking at there are uh, to look at the bandwidth, the availability, which devices are supported on these networks, and what security they provide. And I put a very simple sort of tick list um, nomenclature there. Um, no surprises, I think. But uh, so in terms of bandwidth, obviously Wi-Fi tends to give the greatest bandwidth, followed closely by 3G networks, uh, and then Tetra. But I'll come on just to talk about some of the nuances of that in a second. In terms of um, availability, Private Tetra networks get the three ticks um, absolutely available. When commercial cellular networks become congested, the Tetra network is still available. So, Bluetooth, um, some sort of secure Bluetooth solution. Um, and then finally, security. Uh, Tetra, obviously, highly secure system. Cellular networks, some security, um, but not over all parts of the network. 
and Wi-Fi clearly uh, can be the most insecure and, and uh, uh, extreme security protocols need to be applied to that for law enforcement. A couple of things to note there. Um, one thing we found practically on the ground is that in fact commercial 3G networks often suffer, and, uh, suffer critically from congestion, obviously from all the iPhones that are out there and similar smartphones. And we find that during lunch times and afternoons, the performance of those networks drop off dramatically. Um, and often it's better to fix devices to, to GPRS rather than to 3G, and we get better throughput that way, perversely, but often those networks, the GPRS side of the network is less congested than the 3G side, and for, for much of the data that we use, uh, provides very acceptable performance. Um, the other thing to note here, that we've used Tetra-based networks, and they do provide satisfactory performance, particularly for text and compressed images. You can do a lot with Tetra data, provided the application is designed well. So um, <clears throat> really the, the story of all of that is there is no one network, particularly in public safety, there is no one network that ticks all the boxes and it's always a compromise. Um, often we find the optimum solution is actually to use a combination of networks, a, a 3G network and a Tetra network, uh, and that is in fact a solution that we've implemented for the Metropolitan Police in London in their vehicles. Uh, you can see the little diagram down the bottom of the slide, so the in-vehicle computer connects to both 3G and to Tetra, and the device decides in real time which network it's going to use. So by preference, it will use the 3G network for the data throughput, but it's constantly measuring that network, not only to see if it's in coverage, but also to see if it can actually get data through. So in other words, is the network congested or not? Because you can have very good coverage, but very little data throughput. And if it doesn't get data through by 3G, then it will automatically switch over to Tetra. And this is completely seamless to the user, so the user doesn't see this going on, the user session is maintained, they don't have to log in again, um, and when the device um, has finished with Tetra, it will automatically switch back to 3G. Um, and typically we see these devices running around London, about 80% of the time they're on the 3G network, and about 20% of the time they'll switch to the Tetra network uh, and make use of, um, of, of that network. I mentioned uh, handheld devices um, can do a similar thing, uh, either using Bluetooth or, or using, uh, using Wi-Fi. So the next aspect I wanted to talk about is the actual choice of devices. And here I'm looking primarily at the handheld PDA type devices. Um, and there are really two, two main decision points in, in uh, the public sector market at the moment. And that is, do you go for a consumer device, a smartphone? Uh, you can see at the top of the slide there on the right hand side, a smart HTC device, which we deployed with um, various customers. Or do you go for an enterprise device, so a slightly more rugged, uh, device that's designed for the corporate market and you can see uh, at the bottom right there is a, is a Motorola enterprise device which is designed uh, for these sort of um, rugged applications. So down the left hand side of the chart there <clears throat> I've listed some of the decision factors. The first thing is the initial cost and that's often the overriding factor but it's not really the whole story. So the initial cost is often lower for a consumer device than it is for an enterprise device. But we find the lifetime cost is actually tends to be higher for a consumer device. And the reason for that is that the consumer devices, the smartphones, are now going out of production so quickly um, that as soon as you choose a device for a customer, you almost immediately have to choose the next device and then do all the testing and integration on that new device. So typically now we're seeing smartphones going out of production in six month cycles. Uh, and uh, also typically you get very, very little notice from the suppliers um, so if you've got a contract to supply, say, 2,000 devices to a customer uh, and HTC or whoever it is decide they're not going to make that device anymore, you really have no say. You know, HTC aren't going to be interested in, in, in that kind of level of supply and you can be left without a, without a device. Size and weight is a very important consideration. Consumer devices tend to be lightweight, smaller. The enterprise devices tend to be larger, bulkier, although that's not always the case. Uh, and particularly if you're looking at covert use in public safety, um, then often the consumer, well, in almost exclusively, the consumer devices will blend in, whereas enterprise devices will be fairly obvious that you're a public safety user, so they can't be used in covert situations. Um, screen technology is very important. Uh, capacitive or resistive touch screens. Capacitive screens tend to come on consumer devices. Resistive screens tend to come on enterprise devices. Capacitive screens are very difficult to use with a glove or in fact impossible to use with a gloved hand. So often in public safety, 
resistive screens are better, but not always, but it's a key, a key factor. And then the final two points are uh, the lifetime of supply and manufacturer support. Um, so typically, as I mentioned, a consumer device will go out of production very quickly and you get very limited support. But with an enterprise device, you can typically get guaranteed supply for three or five years and support for three or five years after that. So if you're looking at a public safety environment, um, the enterprise devices can be a much better option um, and total, total cost of ownership can be lower. We have an example of one customer of ours. We started off with consumer devices because they were cheap uh, and, and uh, freely available, well not freely, but uh, readily available. Um, and we've already gone through two devices with that customer in a short period of time. And now that customer is looking at enterprise devices to stop this sort of turnover of device. Um, so the final main point I wanted to turn to uh, is the question of security, obviously absolutely critical uh, in a public safety uh, mobile data system. Uh, and this diagram here is a representation of the sort of architecture which we would normally implement for our customers. Um, over on the left-hand side, you can see the various devices. So we've got the enterprise PDA, the consumer PDA, and also the in-vehicle MDT type system, which typically tends to be a touchscreen embedded in the, uh, in the dashboard of a vehicle. Um, all those devices connect over various networks, as we mentioned, 3G, GPRS, uh, Tetra-based airwave network in the UK, for example, secure Wi-Fi, and various other um, networks, which I won't go into details on, but other networks which, um, which various police forces want to use. Um, all those devices connect into a central secure mobility gateway, and this is, uh, this is the component that really provides the security. So the gateway is responsible for making sure that only trusted devices connect into the system, uh, that only authorized users um, connect in, um, and it also sorts out these devices switching between 3G and Airwave if they're on both networks. So it can cope with a device popping up on one network and then popping up on another network, and it knows how to get the data to those devices. Um, so the gateway provides the absolutely key separation between the dirty side on the left, if you like, the insecure mobile phone networks, and the secure side on the right. All the data between the device and the gateway is encrypted, not just over the air, but also on any fixed infrastructure before the gateway as well. So it's a complete end-to-end -end encryption from the device to the gateway. Um, and the gateway also does things like compress data to, to optimize the, through, the throughput over the, uh, over the mobile networks. Then on the right-hand side of the diagram, you've got your secure network, the secure side of the architecture. So the mobile devices aren't allowed to connect to the systems on the right. So the secure back office systems can only be connected to via the gateway. So the gateway acts as a proxy for these mobile devices um, and allows the secure connection uh, in the middle. And typically, we'd see a whole range of back-end devices. We've got a list there of, of the sorts of devices that we connect to and various interfaces to these devices. So sometimes there'll be web services interfaces, sometimes straight file systems, databases, um, obscure TCP IP based interfaces. Um, but with a modular system in the center, um, you can connect to all these various backend systems. Um, and the final thing that the gateway provides you as well is administration of the system, which is critical to security. So the ability to be able to audit devices, to be able to stun and kill devices, to know when devices are being used and what they're being used for and who's logging on to the devices. So that's a, that's a key element of security as well. So just to sum up, um, our experience is that mobile data provides real and measurable benefit uh, to police and uh, law enforcement agencies. In terms of bearers, there's no, really, there's no single bearer that meets all the needs and often we find that a multi-bearer solution is the optimum. Very careful consideration is needed <clears throat> between the choice um, of particularly handheld devices, whether you go consumer or enterprise, but increasingly enterprise devices now look, look better than consumer. And security needs to be designed in from the absolute outset and is a key part to these, uh, these sorts of solutions. So thank you very much. Any questions at all? for Andrew arising from that very interesting and helpful presentation I think if not I 
I have one, if I may. Um, you, you were lumping there on the air interface side, um, GPRS 3G and Transcom and Airwave, <clears throat> which I know to be a Tetra bearer. Yes, I should, should have said Tetra, actually. Apologies for that. No, no, no. No, you did, actually. Uh, but I, I just wanted to be clear that... Uh, we have all been told so many times at this kind of event that Tetra is a secure uh, bearer, that it has the inherent air interface encryption and the option for end-to-end -end encryption. <clears throat> but you seem to be saying that there was still a need to put that through your secure gateway. Is, is there some additional level of security that you're adding to a Tetra bearer? No, so the, 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 the need for the gate, if, if you were using purely a Tetra-based network and only Tetra, then you wouldn't need the secure gateway. Uh -huh. uh, the reason the gateway is required is because connections are being accepted not just from Tetra, but also from 3G networks as well. Okay. Um, and it's particularly where devices are using 3G <coughs> and Tetra that the gateway provides the added security. But in a, in a Tetra-only network, uh, it's probably still wise to deploy some form of gateway to give you the auditing you need. Um, but you don't need something uh, with, that, with that level of security. It's really when you get the commercial networks in the frame that the gateway is needed. And if you, if you, are, then, um, if you are using the gateway for, for commercial networks, then to be honest, we find you may as well layer in the security over, uh, over Tetra as well. So it's, it's actually harder to say, take the security off when you're on Tetra and put it back on when you're on commercial, rather than just to say, well, just put the blanket security on whatever network you're, whatever network you're on. Sure. Yeah, perfect. So, anything else for Andrew? Yes, we have one question down here. Thank you, sir. Can you tell us who you are and where you're from? Uh, my name is uh, Gislain Bourgeon, and I'm from Cisco. Okay. Um, and I was wondering, what's the layer of intelligence that you provide in the car in order to be able to, to route the information between uh, the, the 3G in order to provide the, the Wi-Fi uh, connection and so <coughs> on? So, basically, I, I suppose the question is there. Is there an IP router in there, or otherwise, how can you do uh, this uh, intelligence? How do you provide this intelligence? Sure. So the, the intelligence is in uh, is in software rather than hardware. Um, so there's an application on the device which is constantly testing whatever networks are available. So it is it is essentially sending uh, small chunks of data to the gateway over each network at regular intervals, and is testing whether it's got throughput and what sort of throughput is getting. And when that throughput drops off below a given threshold, um, then the software will decide it's time to change to a different bearer. And when I say change, I, I, I didn't, probably didn't explain that the, the device is connecting via all bearers at all times. So it's got a 3G connection up at all times. It's got an, a, a Tetra packet data connection up at all times. So the, the, the connections are open. Um, what it's doing in real time is it's testing those connections and deciding which one it's gonna use. And that is based upon real-world throughput rather than coverage, because coverage is a very, very inaccurate measure uh, of the actual um, status of a, of a mobile network. So it is in software. Um, obviously, coming from Cisco, you'll be interested in a hardware solution. Uh, there's no reason why it couldn't be a, a hardware solution as well, and that function could well be performed uh, in a hardware device uh, as well. Very good. Well, thanks very much again, Andrew. Appreciate that and very helpful information.